I'm a solutions architect with Comforte. First, a little housekeeping. For the audio part of this presentation, you can either use your PC speakers or you can dial into the conference using the phone number shown on the screen. Your phone will be muted for the duration of the webinar to minimize the background noise and distractions. However, you'll have an opportunity to submit questions using the webinar dialog box. I'll attempt to record this webinar, and if I'm successful, it will be made available to you early next week. There will also be a short survey following this webinar. Please fill it out and provide feedback so we can continue to improve our webinar process. First, a bit about Comforti. We have been in the Tandem community for more than 25 years, with over 350 nonstop customers worldwide. Comforti offers world-class terminal emulators for the nonstop environment, including MR Win 6530. We're well known for our suite of security products. In addition, we have just added BOSS and SafePoint products with the acquisition of unlimited software associates and security solutions from Baker Street Software and Cross L Software. We now offer complete one-stop shopping for your non-stop security needs. In the middleware space, we have IR360, which provides MQ management for a broad range of platforms, including HP Nonstop, and Client Server Link, which provides service-oriented architecture solutions for the HP Nonstop. CSL will be a focus of our presentation today. Comforti also enjoys a close working relationship with HP. Our MR16530 terminal emulator was selected by HP for the nonstop console emulator. Our SecureSH product was recently chosen by HP for the nonstop console encryption and is being marketed by HP as HP Nonstop SSH. Also, our SecureLib SSL is used to encrypt the TCPIP connection for HP's open systems management. SOA, or Service Oriented Architecture, continues to be one of the key directions for information technology with broad acceptance that continues to gather momentum. In our webinar today, we will briefly focus on what SOA is and why it is important to the HP Nonstop community. We'll focus on some of the alternative approaches to enabling pathway servers into a service oriented architecture and examine the trade-offs between using SOAP versus high-performing APIs. And we will examine a couple of usage scenarios where customers have chosen SOA to unlock the capability of their HP nonstop systems. Fundamentally, SOA is an architecture for systems development where functionality and grouping around business processes and packaging as interoperable services. Emphasis is on abstraction and encapsulation of the services to better leverage their reusability and to shelter the application developers from needing to know the implementation details of the services they are consuming. Ideally, the application should not care which type of platform is used or where the service is running. So, is SOA a new technology? Well, the answer is no. SOA is not new. SOA principles are at the heart of many well-known protocols, including Enterprise Java Beans, DCOM, and CORBA. But I think it is fair to say the real momentum behind SOA has been fueled by the SOAP or web service initiatives. Let me make a clarification here. Many people have been confused into thinking SOA and SOAP are the same thing. They are not. SOAP is just one of the protocols which can be used in a service-oriented architecture implementation. SOAP has been key to simplifying the development of SOA and has been fundamental to many organizations' development plans, but as many of us have come to realize, SOAP isn't always the right answer. It has performance implications which may not be suitable to all SOA initiatives, but more on that later. Also, SOA is not a technology at all. Rather, it is an architectural style which promotes encapsulation and abstraction of services. Okay, but what does this mean to us? 
although it was initially thought of as a way to modernize the aging SCOBOL green screen interface to our Pathway server applications, SOA has been increasingly recognized as a fundamental way for our HP nonstop systems to integrate into the broader enterprise IT solution. All too often, the nonstop system is appreciated for its tandem fundamentals of reliability and scalability, but viewed as that black box in the corner, which can't participate in the global business initiatives for operation, management, and security. Consequently, the tandem is often targeted for replacement with some other platform which does fit in. With SOA, our HP nonstop system can be integrated into those enterprise IT initiatives. With SOA, we can leverage the business logic built into those reliable pathway servers and extend them in new ways. Part of the philosophy of SOA is the abstraction and encapsulation of the pathway servers into discrete services. This means you can now tailor the functionality available to the new audience. You can grant or restrict specific features of the pathway server, and you can aggregate the services across multiple pathway servers into a single representation. This gives you flexibility to rapidly adapt to new business requirements. In addition to enabling our pathway servers to behave as service providers in an SOA, it also means the ability for our HP nonstop applications to perform as service consumers. For example, providing SOAP client capability to your nonstop application enables it to send requests to remote web services. So let's take a closer look at some of those benefits we just discussed. Many companies are adopting an enterprise-wide IT philosophy around support for an enterprise service bus. The mainstream platforms of Windows, Unix, and Linux are well suited to connect with this architecture as service consumers. And most of the enterprise applications are also designed to take advantage of this relationship. Certainly any CIO with a Unix background will be comfortable with this approach. However, many traditional TANM applications with their specialized design are not well instrumented to take advantage of this essential corporate fabric. And, as mentioned before, we've seen many companies with initiatives to migrate those applications from HP nonstop to a platform which can participate. Well, the good news is this gap can be bridged by bringing SOA initiatives to the HP nonstop and by embracing more open standards by converting our proprietary inscribed databases to SQL. We have here an example of a couple of pathway servers which use 6530 to access SCOBOL requesters. These requesters in turn access the pathway servers which maintain a database. In our example, we have one environment for managing flight information and one environment for managing hotel information. These could be on the same nonstop system, but to add a, little bit, a bit of complexity, let's say they're running on different systems. If we SOA enable the pathway servers, this means we can access them from a service consuming environment like Windows or Unix. Doing so, we can now leverage features and functions of the pathway servers in different ways. In this example, we are consolidating the information from two pathway servers into a single consumer. We can now tailor the way the services are used. This provides targeted functionality for users we may not have considered with the old 6530 to SCOBOL interface. From that same service consumer, you can also access other platforms to provide a comprehensive end-user solution. We can take this a step further. If we also migrate the inscribed files to SQL tables, it brings a wealth of new ways we can directly access the database. For example, Car Scott has a product called Escort SQL, which facilitates this process. Car Scott's Escort SQL provides tools for incremental migration of the inscribed files to SQL tables. It does this migration without needing changes to the logic or coding of the existing applications. When the database migration is complete, 
calls from the pathway server to the database are intercepted by the escort SQL plugin and transparently without the pathway server knowing or caring it is now accessing the SQL database instead of the inscribed database. New development can now be done with protocols like ODBC and JDBC to directly access the SQL database. So we can use a combination of SOA to leverage the pathway application and escort SQL to open up the database to enable the HP nonstop to fully participate in the enterprise IT environment and no longer be the black box in the corner. We took a quick look at Car Scott's Escort SQL to open up the database. Now we'll look at using Comforte's client server link to enable the nonstop pathway server as an SOA service. CSL provides a service-oriented architecture infrastructure to access HP nonstop servers from a variety of client programming and runtime environments. CSL supports APIs to access the HP nonstop from Windows, Unix, Linux, and uh, SAP environments. These APIs can be invoked using J2EE, Java, or .NET languages like C Sharp or Visual Basic. And maybe most importantly, CSL enables deployment of the nonstop application as either a SOAP server or a SOAP client. Let's take a look at the environment we're trying to SOA enable. In a typical pathway environment, it's the job of the Skillball requester to collect the user data, populate the request message, and send the message to the pathway server over a standard path send interface. It's the job of the pathway server to receive the request message, process the transaction, and send the response back to the Skillball requester. If our goal is to enable access to the pathway server without modifying that server, it's clear the message we deliver must be in the same DDL format and over the same path send interface which the server would expect to use when communicating with a Scoball requester. CSL was designed to run in the Guardian environment and although it can work with them, does not require OSS or ITP. SOA enabling pathway servers requires no changes to those pathway servers. CSL Studio is a powerful GUI environment to enable rapid development of SOA implementations. CSL has all the scalability and availability you would expect from the nonstop system. There are three different approaches to SOA enablement which we will go through in some detail over the next few slides. The first approach is to use a high-performing API designed for the client platform. The second approach is to generate code stubs using CSL Studio, which leverage the CSL APIs. And the third approach is to use CSL Studio to implement to the widely adopted SOAP standard for web services. Let's go into some detail of each of these approaches. With the first approach, Client developers build their SOA service consumer client using CSL's high-performing APIs. The client developer is responsible for construction of the native message which the pathway server is expecting. This can be fairly straightforward if the data structure is of the message is simple, but it can be tedious to manage if the data structure is complex or large. Once the client generates the native message, it uses the CSL APIs to send the native message over TCP IP to the CSL server component on the nonstop system. This native message represents the actual message the pathway server is expecting and is therefore very efficient. With the second approach, we leverage on top of the CSL APIs we saw in the first approach. The difference is, CSL Studio is used to provide the client developers with code stubs which represent the pathway server interface and help isolate them from needing to know the details about the nonstop environment. This allows them to focus on what they know best, client development. The message construction is handled by CSL instead of relying 
on the client developer to construct the correct message. So how does it accomplish this? In most pathway environments, there already exists a data definition language which defines the message the pathway server is expecting to receive. This is often used to define the interface between the SCOBOL requester and the pathway server. We start by loading the DDL file into the CSL Studio. CSL Studio is then used to generate code stubs in the programming language of your choice. These code stubs are encapsulated uh, are an encapsulation of the data and functions of the pathway server. The code stubs are now ready to be deployed to the client development environment. Once we've generated the code stubs using CSL Studio, the next step is to deploy them to the client development environment. These code stubs are used by the client developer to populate the values of the data elements. The data abstraction allows the client developer to be isolated from the details of the pathway interface. Once the request message is populated, the client can invoke the pathway server. This causes the request message to be sent to the nonstop system over TCP IP. There, the CSL server module sends the message to the pathway server. The pathway server processes the request as if it had come from a SCOBOL requester and returns the reply message to the client. As with the previous approach, the efficient native message is transported using the high-performing CSL APIs. Our third and final approach is to deploy the pathway server using the widely adopted SOAP standard. This will effectively turn the pathway server into a SOAP server. A very important part of the SOAP standard is the use of a WSDL or Web Service Descriptor Language file to describe the service. The WSDL file describes the message and operations of the service. What makes SOAP so powerful is the broadly accepted is that this WSDL file can be referenced from any of the major development environments to instantly have the client development aware of the characteristics of the server. So a key step in the generation of this WSDL file is to represent our pathway server. As we did with the code stubs approach, we start with the DDL which describes the request and response message the pathways, pathway server is expecting. This time, however, we have the CSL Studio generate the WSDL file which will represent our pathway server. A SOAP conversion module is also generated. The SOAP conversion module will be used at runtime on the nonstop system to convert the SOAP message into the native message the pathway server is expecting. Once we have generated the WSDL, it can now be delivered to the client developers. As we mentioned before, the WSDL file can be referenced from a broad range of development systems, including .NET and Eclipse. As with the code stubs, client developers are abstracted from the interface details of the non-stop environment, so they can rapidly develop their clients to access the pathway server. From this, the client developers can write their code to populate the request message, invoke the pathway server, and receive the response. This SOAP client is then deployed to the client platform. At runtime, the user populates the data from which the SOAP client generates the SOAP message and sends it to the nonstop system over HTTP. The SOAP message is an XML representation of the data. There is also an HTTP header and a SOAP header with the SOAP message, so the SOAP message can be quite large compared to the native message. On the nonstop system, the SOAP message is converted from XML representation to the native pathway message and sent to the pathway server. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulties with the slides.
Okay, while we're on the subject of SOAP, CSL is also capable of enabling the nonstop application to perform the functions of a SOAP client. This enables it to access the remote web service. When accessing a remote web service, the key is in the WSDL which describes that service. So our first step is to reference the WSDL using the CSL Studio. Referencing the WSDL brings all the information about the service into CSL Studio. This includes message structure and operations descriptions. Next, CSL Studio will generate SOAP client stubs, which are utilized by the nonstop application to populate the request and send the SOAP message to the remote web service and receive the response. With our previous slides, we focused on enabling existing nonstop applications as SOA services. Since the nonstop pathway servers already existed, this follows an implementation first model. The final SOAP feature of CSL we will discuss is the ability to develop completely new nonstop servers using the contract first model. With contract first, you design the characteristics of the application before you begin coding. So, with our contract first model, we start by developing the WSDL. This WSDL will describe the message structure and the operations of our new nonstop application. We can now reference this WSDL with the CSL Studio. It will generate web service pathway skeleton which can de be deployed to the nonstop system. The nonstop application developer then writes the business logic for the application and leverages the skeleton to expose the application as a SOAP web service. While we are developing the nonstop application using the contract first model, the client developer can simultaneously be developing their SOAP client using the same WSDL we use to enable the nonstop application. The SOAP client is then able to send the SOAP request to our nonstop application. Note that since the SOAP message is native to our nonstop application, we do not need to convert the SOAP XML message into a native pathway message. As we have seen, the CSL Studio is an important tool for developing our SOA services. It facilitates the process to enable rapid development and deployment. It can either function independently or as a plug-in to your Eclipse development environment. So let's summarize the SOA enabling approaches. Approach one is the base CSL APIs and is a low-cost, entry-level way to SOA enable your Pathway servers. It is also designed to be a direct replacement if you are currently using RSC APIs and want to use a richer language like Java, or if you want improved performance. As we noted before, using just the CSL APIs, the client developer is responsible for the construction of the native message the Pathway server is expecting. Approach 2 leverages the high-performing CSL APIs and enables use of code stubs generated by CSL Studio. This enables rapid deployment of your SOA solution. This approach does support mixed client environments, for example, Java and .NET, but this approach will require independent code stubs to be generated for each programming environment. Approach 3 deploys the Pathway server as a SOAP server. This is ideal for mixed client environments because you only need to generate and support a single WSDL for all the client development environments. This is capable of enabling your Pathway application to be both a SOAP server and a SOAP client. And for new application development, it promotes the contract first model. As we have seen, the drawback of using SOAP is the SOAP message is verbose. After you provide the XML representation of the data and add the SOAP header and HTTP header, the message can be quite sizable. It's not uncommon to have the SOAP message more than 10 times the size of the native message. This has many performance implications. You need to transport the larger message over the network. If you are encrypting the message, then you have a much larger message to encrypt and decrypt. And finally, the SOAP message needs to be converted from SOAP XML message into the native message before sending to the pathway. The same is true for the reply message. This can be CPU intensive. 
It is important to note these performance implications are true for any SOAP implementation, not just for CSL SOAP. Okay, we've talked about deploying your Pathway server as an SOA service, but what about security? Obviously, if you are now transporting sensitive data over public networks, you do need to encrypt that information. Uh, SSL is a logical choice for encrypting data transmission for any of the SOAP or SOA initiatives. But I think probably a more interesting question is authentication. A little background, typically what we find in existing pathway environments is that what we find is there's a master SCOBAR requester that is accessed from the 6530 environment. The SCOBAR requester will typically access an authentication pathway server with username and password to identify that this particular operator should be granted access to the unit pathway servers. If they are not authorized, then they don't get access to those other pathway servers. Now, if we take and apply an SOA solution to this, where we've designed an SOA client to access through to a pathway server, we really don't have to go through that authorization pathway server. We can go directly to that unit pathway server, but the question here is, do you really want to? Do you really want to circumnavigate that pathway application's authentication environment? So there are a couple of things that need to be considered and some options that you can consider. One is that you can take the, the actual pathway server that was used for authentication for that application environment and you can design that as also web service, then you put the intelligence in the SOA client to do that authentication using that pathway server. You can just rely on the local client authentication. Um, if you are comfortable that your uh, client machines are in secure areas and that operators that log on to those systems are authorized to access that service, then you can rely on that. We also have um, with CSL, we have a reference implementation for an authentication engine such that you can do authentication of each of the accesses to the uh, web services as you're doing them on the nonstop system. As you can see from this list, CSL is broadly deployed. I'd like to pick a couple of these customers to give you some idea of example implementations. AIT has evolved their nonstop pathway environment to be open on many fronts. Initially, their ASYST client had only a 6530 green screen access to their pathway server. They wanted to modernize this, so they used JPATH to convert the old green screens to an out-of-the-box GUI representation. This was a good start, but for some of their pathway servers, they wanted to use a more powerful interface. They wanted the flexibility to access the pathway servers directly without going through the SCOBAR requesters. For this, they implemented a web service interface to their ACIS client, and then on the WebSphere platform, they used CSL J2EE API to access those critical pathway servers. They also implemented an interface to directly access the SQL database using JDBC from the WebSphere platform. They could not have done this if they were using an inscribed database. First Data Polska had an IT integration problem. They had an enterprise IT architecture vision where their IT infrastructure would be web service enabled and processed through BPAL. Their other application environments, CMS with Oracle, for example, fit in well with this architecture. But their nonstop system, running ACI's Base24, didn't fit in. They either needed to find a way to integrate it into the enterprise IT environment or replace the nonstop system. Using CSL's J2EE API, they were able to develop a web service endpoint for Base24 and enable access to those critical pathway servers. If you recall, the title of this webinar is SOA Enabling Pathway Servers to SOAP or Not to SOAP. I'd like to conclude with a discussion of the to SOAP or not to SOAP question. 
In my opinion, it depends on your implementation. SOAP has some very attractive qualities. It is a broadly adopted standard, which makes it an excellent solution when you anticipate that the client environment will involve many platforms running many languages. It can also be the right solution if you need an out-of-the-box solution for integrating into an existing enterprise IT SOA implementation. However, there are many persuasive reasons to deploy an SOA using high-performing APIs. Clearly, this is an advantage if your application has large, complex data structures and you need to have high transaction rates. It is also the logical solution if you currently use RSC and need to improve the capability. This concludes the webinar. I'd like to open up for questions now. If you would please submit your questions using the GoToMeeting dialog box, I'd be happy to answer them. Also, I'd like to remind you that there will be a brief survey which will follow the webinar. Please do fill it out.